Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bradford Seminar. It's a particular pleasure today to introduce our speaker, uh, Bob Kopp. Bob describes himself on his website as a climate scientist, geobiologist, and climate policy scholar. He's also a professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Rutgers University and director of the Institute of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Science at the Rutgers. Bob's bachelor's degree is from the University of Chicago. He also has an MS and PhD in geobiology from Caltech. Uh, Bob joined my group as a step postdoc for two years, um, where his interest in sea level rise and probabilistic approaches emerged as he produced the first credible and probabilistic estimates of last interglacial sea level rise. And uh, this was a, uh, a key question because the last interglacial is the closest analog we have for the climate of later this century. So it had substantial implications uh, if they're taken seriously in the policy arena. Uh, simultaneously, he did some work with Denise Mauserall on an entirely different problem. Bob then served as uh, AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow in the Office of Climate Change Policy and Technology and the Office of Policy and International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Energy, where he gained expertise in integrated assessment modeling and brushed up hard against the policy arena got to love it. Uh, in 2011, Bob went to Rutgers where, combining his interest in physical climate science and climate impacts with his experience in government, uh, he soon became the go-to person for assessments of sea level rise. First, pioneering the field of estimation and probabilistic prediction of local sea level rise as opposed to global. Um, you have to do both in order to do local sea level rise. Uh, then performing such analysis, that is a specific place-based analyses of future sea level rise for uh, coastal policy efforts that were emerging in California, Maryland, New Jersey, New York City, Boston, and now with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where he's involved as a contributing author in the current assessment, the special report on Oceans and uh, um, oceans and cryosphere, and later he'll be involved in the sixth assessment. In this way, his work has had a broad impact on both the science of sea level rise and potentially the solutions eventually implemented. While all this was going on, Bob took on the job of lead scientist with the American Climate Pros Prospectus Project. Uh, full name is American Climate Prospectus Economic Risks in the United States. This, is, uh, this was the technical underpinning of the so-called Risky Business Project, which was put together by uh, Michael Bloom Bloomberg, Tom Steyer, and Hank Paulson, and led eventually to, or as a result, the um, Climate Impacts Lab, which is uh, a venture which is revolutionizing the analysis of climate impacts by modernizing the uh, methodological approaches. Uh, that was spun off, uh, and uh, Bob has, is now a, di a director of that effort, along with uh, Sal Shang, who was also a postdoc uh, at STEP. Along the way, most recently, Bob uh, won the AGU's McElwain Award for significant <coughs> contributions to geophysical scientists, uh, sciences by an outstanding uh, early career scientist. Bob is indefatigable, uh, unsurpassed as a collaborator, and a terrific colleague and friend. And he's here today to discuss coastal risk in an age of sea level rise. Please join me in welcoming Bob. Thank you, uh, Michael, uh, for that very kind uh, introduction. And thank all of you for, for packing the room. It's a really great audience uh, uh, here. Um, it's always good to be uh, back at Princeton to give a talk. I was looking, and I think it was last time I was in this room was just about a year ago for uh, uh, one of the workshops on uh, uh, the Climate Futures Initiative. Um, so 
Denise asked me to talk about sort of what I think are major problems in adaptation. So what I've done is sort of take the coastal problem and sort of looked at it as a case study. And so I'm, throughout this talk, I'm going to try to pull out um, some general lessons that I think might be applicable in contexts other than coastal change. Um, but first, uh, while I know many of you, for those of you who don't, I just wanted to introduce the institute that I direct and um, my lab. Um, so the Institute of Earth, Oceans, and Atmospheric Sciences at Rutgers is four years old, but it's de uh, descended from the Institute of Marine and Coastal Sciences, which dates back to the late 1980s. Um, and our uh, mission is focused on both sort of the understanding of the past, present, and future of the Earth system and on using that knowledge uh, to develop the perspective needed for stewardship of a healthy, uh, sustainable, and resilient planetary environment. So our work stretches from sort of understanding the formation of the solar system from lunar samples to running um, through the Center for Ocean um, Observation Leadership, one of the world's leading robotic observation networks, to fisheries, to coastal risk, to, to polar science. Within my research group, there are sort of three main th threads, which, which Michael sort of highlighted. Um, sort of my, the core sci uh, sort of basic science uh, involves piecing together um, records of past environmental and sea level change using combinations of statistical and geophysical methods and geological data. Um, as Michael mentioned, from my experience at the Department of Energy and working with um, the U.S. government's social cost of carbon pr uh, process, I got into um, the area of sort of integrated climate risk assessment and management, uh, which largely now happens through a collaboration with the Climate Impact Lab. Um, and then we've, emerging from these two areas, um, have gotten increasingly into the area of sort of coastal climate risk and resilience and how we take the scientific knowledge we're developing it and translate it into action. Um, so just uh, to get us all on the page, a few things we all know. Um, so one, we're living in a time of extraordinary environmental change. Right? Th this graph, of course, is showing you um, the CO2 record from the Vostok ice core in Antarctica, which dates back 800,000 years, spliced onto the observational record of the last uh, three-quarters century. In spring 2014, carbon dioxide concentrations surpassed 400 parts per million for the first time and well before the history of this record. Um, and now we are well above 400 parts per million, probably for at a very minimum the lifetime of everybody in this room and most likely for centuries to millennia to come. As a consequence of this change, temperatures are rising. Uh, between 1980 and 2017, global average temperatures rose at a rate of almost two-tenths of a degree Celsius per decade, um, leading to a global average temperature in 2017 that was one degree Celsius, or nearly one degree Celsius above the pre-industrial, um, and most likely the second warmest year on record in the instrumental period after the El Nino year of 2016. This has led to changes that impact uh, the risks people experience. Um, for instance, uh, temperatures have risen by more than about eight-tenths of a degree Celsius since the first half of the 20th century in most of the United States, as shown here in this map from the Climate Science Special Report um, issued last year by the um, U.S. Global Change Research Program as part of the National Climate Assessment Process, a report um, I was involved in and, and will come back to a couple of times. And this has led to an increase in the number of heat extremes. Similarly, Getting to the main focus of this talk, sea levels have been rising, and this has led to a, a increased frequency in the number of extremes that are uh, of flood levels, of water levels, superimposed upon the changing sea level baseline. So this figure here, also from the Climate Science Special Report, is showing you the number of nuisance or tidal flooding days per year and a set of tide gauges along the coast of the United States, from Rhode Island here uh, down the Atlantic coast, here's Texas, California, Hawaii. Um, so these are the number of days per year um, exceeding the nuisance flooding threshold. And you can see very easily this dramatic incline that in increase that in some places have reached an order of magnitude sen increase since the 1950s. And of course, this matters from a human perspective. This photo sort of sums up of some of the economic wealth that's exposed to changes in sea level. It's obviously a photo uh, of Newark in, in New York City. Um, about 380 million people around the world currently live within 21 feet or 6 meters of the high tide line. 
areas potentially vulnerable to permanent flooding over the course of the next couple centuries. So here's the structure of my talk. And I, I, I want to lay this out this way because I think it's a structure that, that, that is generalizable to thinking about contexts other than sort of the, the one long-term change being sea level rise in one set of extremes, coastal, coastal flooding superimposed on top of that. So I'm going to start a little bit very briefly with the physical background on the processes driving sea level change and coastal flooding. Um, then talk about the historical experience, both from the instrumental period and the geological record. And then we get to, to sort of thinking about this as a risk problem. So the hazard assessment, you know, what are the different outcomes in terms of sea level and coastal flooding? And what can we say about how likely different outcomes are? But risk isn't just the hazard. It's the intersection of the hazard with the things that are exposed and vulnerable. Um, so then we'll look at sort of the risk assessment, given these hazards, what, are, what are, might the consequences be, and then get into thinking about, well, a little bit, what are the options, and how do we think about the way people respond. And at the very end, I'll talk a little bit about some interesting experiences uh, around risk communication and translating science to action. So first, the physical background. So, of course, when we think about sort of global average sea level change, we're thinking about two main drivers, right? Changes in the volume of water that's in the ocean, right? So as, as the oceans warm, the water becomes less dense. We get thermal expansion, shown here as density changes, and changes in the amount of water in the ocean, most dominantly driven by uh, melting of ice on land. Uh, based on the IPCC fifth assessment report projection, um, of the roughly three millimeters per year of sea level rise we've had, over the last couple of decades, roughly 40% uh, has been driven by changes in the density of water, about half by, amount of, uh, by melting of ice, and about 10% by changes in water stored on land, um, the net effect of groundwater withdrawal um, sort of modulated by dam construction. But when we think about risk, right, we're not thinking about exposure to global average change. We're thinking about exposure in somewhere in particular. And so we have to think about how these global average changes translate into, uh, into location-specific changes. And this is certainly a generalizable point. Global sea sur average surface temperature um, you know, is a useful proxy of climate change. But in and of itself, a 2 degree Celsius warming doesn't really tell you very much. So when we think about melting of ice on land, we have to think about not just um, how much ice is shrinking, but where, it's, but where it's, it's moving from and where it's moving to. Because when you start moving large masses around, and it takes 360 billion tons of ice melting to raise global average sea level by one millimeter, when you start thinking about moving masses around, you change the Earth's gravitational field. You change the Earth's rotation. You cause the crust underneath that load to deform. And so all of these factors give rise to distinctive patterns of sea level change that are different if you're, say, near, a, near the melting Greenland ice sheet, in which case you'll actually experience a sea level um, fall in response to a melting ice sheet because of the change in the Earth's gravitational field, or if you're far from it, in which case you'll experience a sea level rise that's greater than the global average. We have to think not just about global average density changes, but about where the heat in the ocean is, as well as how um, changes in the distribution of heat around the planet lead to changes in ocean circulation and atmosphere-ocean interactions, changes in winds, and how those affect how water, water moves around. And all of these, when we're thinking about sea level impacts on peoples or ecosystem, happen upon a baseline, a, a ground level, that can itself change. Some of that is changes in response to, say, some of these masses moving around. Uh, moving around. Others are changes in response to mass movements that happened thousands of years ago, the ongoing response to the end of the last ice age called glacial isostatic adjustment. And some of it is in response to the dynamics of the solid earth itself, things like plate tectonics. So all of these factors combined to, to give to, uh, rise to a moving, local moving baseline. And then on top of that moving baseline are a set of processes operating at higher frequencies. There's seasonal and interannual variability. So here I'm showing you monthly average um, sea level at the Battery in New York City. And you can see over this period from the 80s to, to recently, um, you know, there's certainly an upward trend, but there's also a much larger sort of interannual variability of, uh, of a couple decimeters superimposed on top of that. If we zoom in to a higher scale, 
we have superimposed on top of that title variability. So here you can see the title signal at the battery. And so, right, so one of the effects of raising the baseline means that these title peaks will reach higher and cause more flooding. And then on top of these effects, the effects of, of tide and interannual variability and changing mean sea level, we also have the effects of water levels driven by storms. Um, so this is a record from October 2012. Many of you will, of course, remember that this is a time of Superstorm Sandy. Um, and so this curve here, the, the dotted line is showing you the predicted tidal change, the blue line, the observed water level, and the green line down here, the difference between those two, the storm surge. Right? And so Sandy, there was about a 2.7 meter storm surge that was superimposed on top of the tidal signal, on top of the interannual variability, and on top of this, this rising baseline. So what actually, if those are the sort of processes we're thinking about, what, what are the things we've actually seen? Well, to look backwards, we have to have some instruments. Over the last couple of decades, since about 1993, we've had satellite observations of the height of the sea surface um, relative to the center of the Earth. But if we want to understand geological con or, or historical context, we have to go back a little further than just the last 25 years. And over those time periods, our fundamental tools are tide gauges. Um, this is a photo of the battery tide gauge, um, obviously at the battery. Um, and the basic idea, traditional idea of a tide gauge is you have something fixed in the ground, you have something floating and you measure the height of the floating thing relative to the thing fixed in the ground. A lot of these now use acoustics or some other techniques other than a bob um, to measure the height of the, of, of the water surface, but it's the same basic idea. And I've already showed you a couple of, of snapshots of um, the battery record. Here is a longer snapshot um, dating back to the 1850s. Uh, so these are uh, monthly averages in uh, blue, and then the red is, is the annual average. Um, and you can certainly see the, the upward uh, trend in the record over, over this time period. Um, but the different tie gauges give you very different signals. And if you want to understand how these different signals piece together to tell you something about things like changes in ocean heat content or changes in the amount of ice on land, you have to understand those physical processes and the uncertainties in the data. Um, so this figure here is just showing you a few other tide gauges from around the world. So here, um, the red are the, an, are the annual observations. The black and the, and the gray are a model fit to them. And I'll, I'll show you some of the model results in a second. But you can see you know, New York has a, has a strong, steady upward trend. Um, in the high Arctic, you get some different signals. In the, in the areas that were underneath ice sheets, you can get something that goes in the opposite direction. And so you have to figure out how to piece all of these together. Um, and these results I'm about to show you are some works that were done in collaboration with Jerry Mitrovica at Harvard and some postdocs we shared, Carling Hay and Eric Morrow. Um, and this figure here is showing you a reconstruction of global average sea level change pieced together from these different tide gauge records, um, taking into account the physics that caused them to be different. Um, and the bottom line is, from, based on this analysis, from 1901 to 1990, global average sea level rose at a rate of about 1.2 millimeters per year. And since 1993, it's risen at a rate that averages about two and a half times further. Um, since we've done this work, um, there's also been some analyses based on satellite da data confirming that there's an observable acceleration um, once you correct for other factors in the sea level trend over this, this the period since 1993. Tide gauges also give us an important source of information for thinking about sea level extremes. So this top plot here is showing you the monthly highest water level at the battery. And you can see there, there's Sandy, um, you know, the 1960 storm. And you can see some of the, these large storms picked out here. And these curves here are showing you storms uh, or flood extreme water levels of different expected return periods with their increasing water levels associated with the rising sea level baseline. This is another way of viewing the same data that I'll come back to in a little bit. So, so this is, is an approach that comes out of sort of thinking about this as a problem of extreme values. So here what we're looking at are different water levels. And here is based on um, either the historical number of things we've seen in the length of the record or some model fit, the expected number of events of a given size you expect to see in a year. So if you see 10 to the minus 1, right, that means there's a 1 in 10 chance 
expect, expected chance in a given year. So we might call that a one in 10 year flood or one in 10 year extreme water level. So these are the different historical storms. So that's Sandy out here at around 2.7 meters. And this is a fit to that curve. So based on this particular analysis of we'd have a one in 100 year uh, extreme water level is roughly two meters. So, so that's what we can do from the instrumental record. Um, it gives us about a century worth of data in some places. The oldest goes back about three centuries. So there's an Amsterdam record going back to 1700. But to go back further, um, we have to turn not to the instrumental record, but to the geological record. Um, and we can turn to records like the one um, being gathered here. This is a photo taken by my uh, collaborator, Ben Horton. Uh, until recently at Rutgers, now at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Um, and the basic idea here is they're in a salt marsh. The, the, micro, um, or, the, the, the microorganisms, the foraminifera in the salt marsh, exhibit different tolerances to different levels of salinity. And so if you get a sediment core and you study the microfossils in that core, you can reconstruct sort of where in the tidal zone each layer was deposited. And then if you combine that with some method like carbon-14 dating of reconstructing how old different layers in the core are, you can reconstruct a sea level history. So we, we did this. We built a database. Um, from around the world and doing a similar sort of statistical analysis pulled out uh, a sea level record for the last 3,000 years of the sort of common global sea level signal. And you can see there's some features in here, the most robust features of which are this decline from around 1,000 to 1,400 CE and this rise since the late 19th century. So the conclusion from this analysis is that the 20th century from 1900 to 2000 global rate of sea level rise with 1.4 millimeters per year was extremely likely with 95% or more probability faster than any century since at least 800 BCE, at which point the quality of the record sort of decays and you just can't say statements with that much precision. Or as President Obama said, uh, we're seeing the fastest rate in sea levels in nearly 3,000 years. And these changes have an effect on, flood, on, on flooding and on extreme water levels. So this is a figure um, from a paper by my colleagues Andy Kemp and Ben Horton um, looking at reconstructions of flood heights, of storm tide heights um, for different large historical storms in New York City, the 1788 hurricane, 1821 hurricane, 1893 hurricane. Um, and then for the more recent ones, decomposing, well, you can see the effect of, of sea level rise down here in the red and the blue, and then for the more recent ones, decomposing into the effects of tide um, and surge. And so you can see from a plot like this how much sea level rise since the 1800s, um, based on geological reconstructions and tide gauge reconstructions, contributed to making Sandy the largest storm on record. The 1821 storm may, in fact, have had a larger surge associated with it. Um, than Sandy, uh, but its timing with the tide may have been different and it didn't have this, this extra um, half meter of sea level rise uh, to contend with. So the generalizable lesson here, and I'll build these out as we go through the talk, um, is that instrumental and geological data are crucial for contextualizing projections of future change. So then let's talk about the hazard assessment. Many of you will be familiar with the representative concentration pathways, uh, but for those of you who, who aren't, when, when I'm going to talk about likelihood of future changes, I'm going to abstract or remove from that the uncertainty in, in, in a whole bunch of human behaviors that have to do with population growth and economic change and technological change and policy change, uh, because trying to project those is both very hard and not at all in my, in my expertise. And so we're going to conditionalize everything we're talking about on a set of emission scenarios. Uh, these are the standard sort of a, a part of the standard set of, of emission pathways that have been developed by the climate modeling and integrated assessment communities. Um, they're known as representative concentration pathways. Um, so RCP 8.5, RCP 4.5, and RCP 2.6. And I usually refer to these as fossil fuel intensive sort of moderate emission reductions. And the RCP 2.6 is the one that has net zero emissions at some point in the second half of the 20th century, which is part one of the goals laid out in the Paris Agreement. Uh, so here's a historical CO2 emissions trajectory. 2016, we were at 41 billion tons. After two years, where emissions had, had uh, plateaued. Um, unfortunately, they seem to have gone up about 1.5% in 2017, uh, which I haven't yet added on to this plot. Um, 
And you can see sort of we were to some extent closest to RCP 8.5, but then this growth rate may be different, and, but the growth rate may be a short-term fluctuation or it may be a start of a long-term change. So who really knows where we are in this space? But we're, we're headed somewhere between those two at the moment, I would say. And we've all, all the nations of the world has agreed we want to be on something like, like that one. So given some emissions pathways, how might we project future change? So one approach, given that we spent this effort into reconstructing past changes, is to see what we can learn uh, from uh, the past that might inform the future. Uh, so here's that sea level record again. And Klaus Bitterman, who at the time he was working on this, was a, a graduate student at, at the Potsdam Institute and uh, is now a postdoc at Tufts, sort of built a statistical model called a semi-empirical model that looked at the, the relationship between um, temperature change and sort of degree of disequilibrium of temperature change and rate of sea level rise. Um, so here are two different reconstructions of temperature over the last uh, at least 1,600 years. Here's a global sea level curve. Um, and when he built the statistical model relating these two things, um, he got this set of projections. Um, so these are sort of the median projections for those three different emission scenarios and then the, the lower fifth percentile and the highest 95th percentile. And these are the fifth to 95th percentile projections for the end of the century. So the bottom line here is that sort of there's, based on this model, there's a 9 in 10 chance that under a high emission scenario, you're projecting about half a foot to 130 centimeters of global sea level rise under, um, by, over the course of the century. A low emission scenario uh, would put you around 20 to 60 centimeters. But this approach, the semi-empirical approach, has a number of limitations. First of all, it's, it's focused on the statistical relationship between global average sea level change and global average temperature changes, and so doesn't have the information to turn that into a local change, which we need for risk assessment. Secondly, there's the broader, the, the broader question of sort of out-of-sample extrapolation. You're going from a time period where temperatures were relatively constrained we had a couple tenths of a degree fluctuation until the 20th century when we got you know, up at a, almost a, a degree fluctuation or a change. Um, and it's calibrated from a period where thermal expansion and mountain glaciers, by and large, were the dominant control on sea level. And we're using it to project forward into a world in which ice sheets play a growing share in sea level. Uh, so in work uh, that involved a number of people here, including uh, Michael and uh, DJ, um, who's, a, who's a, I don't know if DJ's here, but a uh, grad student in STEP now. Um, uh, so we built up a different uh, approach, um, that was sort of a bottom-up accounting approach um, based on uh, uh, sort of building off of work that had been done in, in some ways by the, the IPCC in their fifth assessment report and the New York City panel on climate change. And the basic idea here is fairly simple, right? Look at the different processes driving sea level, which I've already walked you through. Right, land water storage, ice sheets, glaciers, thermal expansion, ocean dynamics, and these sort of non-climatic background processes that largely contribute to the change in, in land height term. Um, and drawing upon those, each of the, for each of the terms, drawing upon different data sources to estimate uh, a distribution of the likelihood of possible futures. Uh, so some easy ones, like so for the non-climatic background term, uh, we sort of looked at extracting that component from the tie gauge record and extrapolating it into the future, assuming it continued in the same rate, which is a good extrapolation. And for some circumstances where you're talking about geological processes, perhaps less good in areas where that's driven a lot by groundwater withdrawal that might be changing. Uh, for land water storage at the global scale, we looked at the historical relationship between demand for water, for dam construction and groundwater in population. Um, thermal expansion and ocean dynamics, those are the sorts of things that climate models do relatively well. And so that's our, our primary information source. For mountain glaciers, climate models can force models of surface mass balance of, of glaciers. And so we use that here and then feed that into a model of the way that moving ice around affects the gravitational and elastic and crustal patterns of change. And then ice sheets are a really hard one because we, here we have a system where sort of the large continental scale behavior of the ice sheet depends upon relatively small scale physics. So this is, is hard to model in a forward sense. Uh, and so for this study, we drew partially upon the expert assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which looked across the literature, looked at ice sheet models and other sources, and then reported out sort of what they judged to be the likely or central you know, 66% probability range. But then because 
looking at only the central projections but not at tail risks is not that useful for risk assessment. We had to do something else. And so we also drew upon information from an approach called structured expert elicitation, um, which is basically a way of asking experts their opinions, calibrating them to how well they do on questions where you know the answers to, and then combining those um, estimates in an optimal fashion. Um, and so we, we took information from these two sources for the ice sheet projections. Michael and I, uh, together with a couple others, are now revisiting this expert elicitation study about six years after it was originally done. So this approach, ha ha as Michael has mentioned, um, has given me the opportunity to work with a whole bunch of different stakeholder groups, mostly at the level of sort of a state assessment panel, rather than sort of the on the ground project specific thing. Um, but it's, these results have been used um, they were originally developed largely to inform the American climate perspectives work that, that Michael mentioned, but they've been used by the Congressional Budget Office, they've been used by, by county level assessments in Washington State, state level assessments in Oregon, New Jersey, California, um, one coming out in Massachusetts, um, and as well as playing an important role in, in the fourth national climate assessment. Um, so, so here are some of the results, and, and this map here is mostly in just an icon to show you that one, um, the projections differ from place to place. So this is the high emission scenario median projections. Um, and these obviously vary for, for each of the scenarios and over time. Um, and then this plot here is showing you the median projections for each of the three emission scenarios and then the central 90% range. Um, and if we look at the global average, and I'm not going to highlight the New Jersey numbers for you, but you can read there and see the difference. All right, the basic bottom punchline is that you're looking at about 10 to 20 centimeters of sea level rise over the first three decades of the century, about 20 to 30 or 20 to 40 centimeters over the first five decades. And then really after the, second half, the middle of the century is where you start to get divergence from these scenarios, roughly 30 to 80 centimeters under the low emissions, 50 to 120 centimeters under the high emissions. And if you remember those numbers I gave you before from the bottom-up assessment, or uh, from the top-down assessment, you will remember that these two numbers are extremely similar, um, almost identical for the high emission scenario. So that's sort of interesting. Uh, pretty good agreement. Uh, and one way you might take this is that that's good. We have two separate sources of information that give us the same or very similar answer. So that increases our confidence in these approaches. But that doesn't actually address some of those central challenges with the statistical approach that I raised earlier. Should we expect the historical relationships of the last two millennia to be a good predictor of 21st century change? Or is this, what this really changing is that maybe there's some implicit historical bias in this bottom-up accounting-based approach too. It's just a little more subtle than in the statistical approach. This is a rapidly evolving area, and I would argue that the past relationships are not necessarily a guarantee of future results. For the reason I mentioned earlier about ice sheets, small, large scale continental behavior depending intimately on small scale physics. Um, processes like the one that happened with the Larsen B ice shelf back in 2002. So here was the Larsen B ice shelf. It's uh, 40 kilometers wide. You can see in late January 2002, these pools of water starting to form at the surface. By March 2002, those pools of water had fractured the ice shelf. Remo the ice shelf itself is floating ice. It has no direct on effect on sea level. But when it's gone, it is no longer able to, to provide a buttressing effect to slow the flow of ice from the continent into the ocean. And so we're working to explore in this framework, what happens when ice sheets don't behave the same way as they've behaved over the last couple millennia. So this is a paper that we came out with last year, um, working with these two gentlemen, among others, Rob DeCanto at UMass and David Pollard at Penn State, who are, who are ice sheet modelers, um, despite Rob's uh, attempt to look very fieldy there. Um, uh, and, and they've built into their model uh, uh, a couple of um, processes that, that hadn't previously been considered in continental scale ice sheet models that have to do with this ice shelf hydrofracturing process we saw here, as well as the instability of large ice cliffs. Um, this photo here from Helheim Glacier and um, looking, you know, you can't really tell in this iconic, in this icon mode, but, but you've got like this, this tens of meters of ice. And the argument is that that ice can only Without a, without an ice shelf here to support it, can only grow so high before it collapses under its own weight. So these are the results I showed you earlier. 
Um, I'm next going to show you some results when we incorporate their additional physics into a continental scale model and use that to replace what we've shown, what we did before. And so I'm going to ask you to look at 2050 and at, at 2100. So for, and I'll flip back and forth. So first at 2050. So at 2050, you see fairly little change. At 2100, however, we see quite a large change, particularly in the high emission scenario. So whereas in our previous assessment under the low emission scenario, we were looking at 30 to 80 centimeters. When we look, substitute this in, we're looking at around 30 to 100 centimeters, so not much change. Under the high emission scenario, we get a broadening uncertainty and a shift upward from 50 to 120 centimeters to about 90 to 240 centimeters. So it's making some very extreme outcomes um, look more like they're within the realm of physical uh, plausibility. In addition, it separates the emission scenarios out more, providing evidence for a much larger sea level difference after 2050 between a world that's consistent with the Paris Agreement and one with more modest emissions reductions. This approach also allows us to ask important questions about what we need to do to monitor and think about um, future changes as we go along into coming decades. So something, thinking about things like the value of information. Because the physics that are necessary, at least in this representation, to drive those high scale, high end outcomes don't play a major role right now, this analysis suggests that large scale observations of things like global average sea level change or total amount of ice loss from Antarctica won't be able to distinguish between a high end outcome, say one leading, as in this one, this graph here, to two meters of sea level rise at the end of the century, and one leading to a lower end outcome, say 50 centimeters, for decades to come. All right, so here, this figure is just showing you these two different pathways. The next figure, I'm going to invert that and say, OK, if we're on, we know we're going to be on one of these two pathways, and we have only these large scale observables, what would we estimate the end of the century sea level rise to be. So here, uh, so these are in each decade a projection for the end of the century. Right? So 2010, we're saying, OK, uh, based on observations today, 40 to 210 centimeters or something is, is your 90% probable range. And you can see that the longer, further you go along, these two paths start to diverge, so that by the end of the century, you know which of those paths you're on. But to distinguish sooner than the second half of the century, this is telling us that we need advances in our fundamental understanding of small scale ice sheet physics. The global and continental scale observations won't do it. In addition, I would suggest a better understanding of how ice sheets behaved during past warm periods would also help by providing a check on whether the models of the small scale physics actually match things we can reconstruct about the past. And though it's not evidence from this plot, if we go back a couple of plots, we emphasize again the point that we greatly reduce the odds of being on this high end path by reducing emissions. Right? This, this outcome is almost excluded in this analysis by being on the Paris consistent path. But in the meantime, before we know what the physics are, before we know which emissions path we're on, we have to make decisions cognizant that it may take decades to resolve deep uncertainty in ice sheet behavior. So, I want, then want to think about how this translates into uh, flood risk. So here, this is that curve I was showing you before, drawn on slightly differently, but expected events per year versus storm tide heights. The basic effect of sea level rise is to shift this curve to the right. So the same flood with half a, a meter of sea level rise, the same uh, a storm that would have produced a meter storm tide um, instead produces a meter and a half. And so from such a half meter sea level rise, you know, the sandy level, we get about a threefold increase in the expected number of floods. And we can get some pretty dramatic increases the more sea level rise we go along. So with one meter, you get an eightfold increase. With one and a half meters, a 37-fold increase. With tw uh, two meters, a 410-fold increase. And a number of complications that I don't have in time to go into arise um, when we start thinking about this um, under uncertain sea level rise. But I will come back to that a little bit in a second. It's also necessary, but, but uh, and this is some work that, that Ning Lin was involved with and is, continues to be heavily involved in, um, to consider the possibility that this curve itself may be changing. Um, so for instance, 
tropical cyclones that drive a significant part of the extreme flood risk at uh, New York City are projected to become more intense in a warming world. Um, but, but these effects can be complicated. So this is work done by postdoc Andrew Garner um, using uh, one particular climate model simulation and a, a statistical downscaling approach for hurricanes that was led um, uh, uh, by, by Carrie Emanuel. Um, and so this is showing you return period for different water heights. And notice perhaps counterintuitively that even though storms are becoming more intense, the return periods that are becoming longer. That is that the, the probability in their analysis of a storm surge driven by a hurricane of a given height is by and large becoming lower. A and in this, the answer why that's happening is that in this particular model simulation, even though the storms are becoming more intense, they're steering in a different direction. And all I want you to take away from this is that it's a complicated problem. Uh, and there's a lot of factors in play. <laughs> Another thing to think about is that changes in extremes may be correlated with changes um, in sea level. Um, so this is some work that Chris Little did when he was a postdoc here. Um, so this was looking at, at the five site mean dynamic con ocean dynamic contribution to sea level rise um, in the eastern US. Um, and this is looking at uh, uh, power dissipation index anomaly, so something that's sort of measuring the intensity of, of, of hurricanes. Um, and you can see that some of the simulations that produce the largest increase in hurricanes also produce the largest dynamic sea level changes. Um, so correlation is something to think about. So, so generalizable lessons. So one is that instrumental and geological data are crucial not just for contextualizing but also for calibrating projections of future change. Second, that the probabilistic methods uh, provide a useful way of structuring knowledge and lend themselves to readily addressing questions about the value of information. And third, when we think about this, these hazards at the end, the interaction among hazards need attention. Looking at individual hazards in isolation provides an incomplete situ uh, picture of the hazards we might face. So then, OK, so what about the risk? What would the consequences would be? Well, one consequence of sea level rise is permanent flooding of land. Uh, this photo here is from Grand Isle, Louisiana, uh, where sea level rose by about two feet from 1947 to 2015, flooding uh, Lee Fort Cemetery. Um, and in work we did for this book that, that Michael mentioned, uh, we looked at basically permanent land that would land that current property values of land that would be subject to that be flooded below the high tide line over the next three decades. Um, and we get a, a number in the range of about 230 to 460 billion dollars of property. That's a large number. It's also important to remember that the value of the property in the United States is, is larger than the size of the US economy, which is a, you know, which is itself about a 17 trillion dollar economy. So important to keep that in, in context, but but this is a large number. Um, oh, I crashed. <laughs> I, I, I crashed my uh, uh, projection. Well, this is, this is my, my, my lovely wife. You can see uh, uh, at, at the bottom there. Um, so let's, uh, let's try opening this up in Acrobat and seeing if that's more stable. Um, so here we go. Let me just do this. Full screen. Sorry, guys. Um, OK, we're just going to catch up with where we were. All right, so changing that sea level baseline also, of course, as I said, leads to increases in flooding. We previously estimated that global sea level rise from 1880 to 2012 um, exposed about 80,000 additional people in New York City and New Jersey uh, to flooding during, during Hurricane Sandy. Um, and so to look at this in, in, that, in that book, The American Climate Perspectives that we mentioned, uh, we partnered with Risk Management Solutions, which is a, a private sector firm that works with insurance companies. Um, and they took their property model, combined it with a whole bunch of synthetic tropical cyclones um, that they modeled the surge of and the, and the tracks of, um, and then at, changed the sea level baseline. Um, so this is showing you from their modeling sort of the expansion of the 1% annual probability floodplain in New York City. So this is a current floodplain um, to the area that falls within that floodplain in 2030, 2050, and so forth, um, based on sort of expectations under current uncertainty. Um, and, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> 
in a paper we published earlier, earlier la or last year, um, so we looked at the relationship between um, the change in this number, sort of the storm surge damages has a percent of GDP and global average sea level rise. And this is showing you in the high emission scenario sort of where those are, obviously they're concentrated along the coast. Um, and so this is our sort of coastal damage function, assuming current property distributions and abandoning property that falls below the mean sea level, but not otherwise taking adaptive measures. Um, so this leads us to the conclusion that in the current economy, each centimeter of global sea level rise would increase U.S. average annual storm damages by about $200 million. And this is somewhat quadratic. So by uh, one meter of sea level rise, we'd be looking at about $500 million of damage per centimeter. So if we combine those with the sea level rise projections, either of those two sets I provided you before, under low emission scenario, we're looking at around 10 to 40 uh, uh, billion dollars of value at risk by 2100. Under the high emissions, uh, 20 to 50, or if you start to factor in those ice sheet stability mechanisms, 30 to 130 billion dollars per year. Again, if, if, if adaptive measures aren't taken. Um, I'm going to skip this for, for, for time. Um, but just mention the things I skipped over, pointed out that we want to think about interactions among risks. So how, say, damage um, along the coast might affect the overall economy, might leave people to move, might also interact with changes in sort of um, heat stress driven, driven impacts. And so we need to be moving to thinking about not just individual hazards and risks, but how these different risks interact. So what might we do about it? So I already mentioned, of course, the dependence upon emissions pathways. And so one key point is that mitigation policy choices will affect the sea level to which we will have to adapt. But the other key point is that they're not going to get rid of the problem. right? Even in the low emission scenario, which is very hard to get to, you're still looking at a substantial amount of sea level rise uh, you know, in the, on the Jersey Shore in the range of about one to four feet over the course of the century. Um, that will have to be managed. What are people doing now? How might we manage this? Well, we could ignore the problem. Uh, we could rebuild essentially unchanged, maybe even gentrify things a little, move a little more property value into the rate, and assume that the current system of subsidies and governance that allows this to happen will continue unchecked. Um, so here's a photo from Ortley Beach. There was a nice um, sort of spread in the Times a few months ago, sort of looking at the, some of these different things along the coast. Um, we can try to sort of modify our communities to accommodate occasional flooding, as this gentleman who has given himself uh, a parking spot and a view of the, the, the shore and, and stayed in place. Um, but this isn't really an individual decision, because this gentleman could end up in his house uh, in the aftermath of the storm if he doesn't evacuate with no electricity, no sewage, not really a great situation, even if, if um, his car is the only thing that floods. Um, we can build hard infrastructure. So this is a, a visualization of the proposed east side coastal resiliency uh, uh, project, um, which has a, a combination of berms and um, some uh, movable flood barriers that can be put in place. Um, and one of the things you have to think about as you harden is what happens when your, your hard structure overtops, like we saw in Katrina. Right? And so that's, that's part of this as well. But, but always remember, things can fail. Do we expand protective natural infrastructure? So here are some, some oyster beds that have been put in place in Jamaica Bay where they can absorb some wave energy and remove some of the hazard associated uh, uh, with storm flooding. Or do we say that some areas just aren't right for people to live in? Um, do we relocate to higher ground? So here is Oakwood Beach in Staten Island, which is an area that after Sandy took a buyout. Um, and the air community is now being given over to, to the birds. Um, and, and that is a, is a choice uh, that in many cases might make the most economic sense, but there's a sequencing decision. For instance, some of my colleagues at Rutgers who work with coastal communities have talked to people who said, well, we would have been happy to move had people come to us in the year after Sandy and said, um, well, please move, here's some money. But instead, they came to us in the year after Sandy and said, here, here's some money, please rebuild with elevation. And well, now they've made that investment and they're no longer interested in moving. Um, so from the on the ground side, this is sort of, you know, there's a lot of choices and we have to think about, about decision processes. From a, from a more abstract sort of global risk assessment, um, uh, 
you know, we have to think about, okay, well, what are the different options and, and how might we choose? So one approach people, people have thought about is sort of this benefit cost analysis. So looking at different options, um, no adaptation, retreat, protect, and say, okay, well, what are the benefit cost trade-offs? These sorts of analyses suggest that benefit cost optimal adaptation has the potential to reduce um, flood damages by in the range of 80 to 90 percent. But these sorts of analyses of current flood risk suggest that benefit cost optimal adaptation has the potential to reduce current flood damages by 80 to 90 percent as well. And so that leads to the question, okay, well, why isn't that happening? Um, Maya Buchanan, who was a graduate student here, was, was starting to work on a problem, sort of trying to look at more complex decision processes using agent-based modeling. Um, and so that's one way of thinking about it. Um, one point I would like to make is that the benefit-cost adaptation way of thinking actually fails under certain circumstances. Right? It fails under circumstances where there is a sufficiently fat tail of risk that the low probability outcomes really from a benefit-cost uh, benefit perspective should dominate your decision making. Right? If there's a very small probability of some extreme outcome, then your expectations become dominated by this. So, so here um, we're looking at a range of different uh, sea level, uh, of extreme water levels, same, same sort of plot I've showed you before. Um, this is a projection for 2050, the expectation under current sea level uncertainty, with a few different ways of treating the tail of projections above the 99th percentile of sea level rise. And this is fine. This suggests you can sort of treat that as an expectation. But when we look to, say, 2080, these different ways of treating things above the 99th percentile lead to a meter of more discrepancy in your expectations about, say, what the height of the 1 in 10 year flood is. Right? And so when you're dealing with a situation like this, uh, there's a good argument to be made that benefit cost adaptation fails, benefit cost analysis fails. Uh, so one approach to think, to think about is sort of flexible adaptation pathways. Right? How do we make decisions now that take advantage of the knowledge that we have now, that we can project now, while um, having an advanced contingency plans. Okay, well, what do we do if we find we're in a world that's going to two feet? What do we do if we're in a world that finds we're going to six feet? And so this is sort of a subway map from a bar uh, the Thames Barrier study, sort of looking at different sea level rise and different options that work in each, and an illustrative path of how you might navigate through them. So generalizable lessons, understanding how people respond is much less mature than what they understanding of, of what they have to respond to. And it's crucial to be cognizant of deep uncertainty and when decision frameworks developed for more shallow uncertainty are and aren't valid. So finally, I want to very briefly conclude with a story uh, uh, about science to action. So um, I was involved in a, a California um, sea level rise assessment that drew upon some of this work that I showed you. Um, and we got some pushback afterwards, um, led by this man, David Bahar, who's at the San Francisco Public Utility Commission. And out of that pushback sort of arose a months-long dialogue process involving these people here. And I just want to share you some of the thinking that came out of that. Um, so the, the concern David had is that pro projections of probabilities of future outcomes were arriving to engineers who weren't used to thinking about uncertainties, not in terms of flood return periods, but in terms of uncertainties expressing some sort of epistemological uncertainty. And now, obviously, I think the engineers here understand that well, but um, the sort of applied city engineer in San Francisco was, were having difficulty with that. Um, so we ended up with a situation of some of the on the ground engineers being skeptical about some of this probabilistic approaches. Um, so David Bahar and some folks from the Army Corps, while the authors who are more rooted in the scientific community or in sort of the, the higher level policy community like Chris Reaver um, were more supportive of their use in decision making. So, so one point there, well, maybe the on the ground planner and the sort of higher level policy require different ways of thinking. Um, the, the conclusion of this is that, that we really need an ongoing dialogue, co-production. Right? We can't just have the state convene an assessment panel, then hand that off to other people to use for, for planning and, and, and zoning guidance. Um, so conclusion one, that greater collaboration is necessary to reduce the dangers of misunderstanding, misapplication, and maladaptation. 
we identified a bunch of benefits uh, associated with probabilistic projections and also highlighted the fact that they actually work quite well just thinking of, in a lot of different frameworks through the middle of the century, um, can support a variety of decision frameworks, um, but require some scaffolding to help people think about using them. But on the other hand, we run into these problems for later in the centuries where the high tail really matters a lot. And so we get a very different ways of, uh, of, of projecting sea level rise. Um, and so this group uh, uh, came to the conclusion that you need several different probability distributions from several different approaches to help you think about uh, um, different approaches that beyond 2050 and that there's a danger in, in the seeming precision of numbers in a single probability distribution that can lead to overconfidence. Um, and so we need to give special consideration to, to, high, to high emissions, to, to high outcome scenarios. Um, finally, I just want to mention that, that this sort of interaction with stakeholders is something we're trying to, to really integrate into the curriculum at Rutgers uh, through things like the Coastal Climate Risk and Resilience Initiative, where we're taking natural science, social science, engineering students together um, and training them to work with one another and stakeholders to solve real world coastal resilience problems. So thanks. So we have about five minutes, and then can you hang around? A little Absolutely. Bit? I don't know who's next on my schedule, but I'm sure they're happy to wait. Questions <laughs> for Bob? Uh, you had a slide. I think you said it was 20 to $30 billion. No, that was that was that was cumulative. So so that was two hundred million dollars per centimeter of annual storm damage without adaptation at current from current sea level baseline. So the, total effect. the total by twenty one hundred would be twenty to thirty billion a year. For the world? For the US. And that seems not as big as I thought it was. <laughs> that is what it is. Um, you know, I mean, so, so just has reference, Sandy was about an $80 billion storm, so that 20 to $30 billion would be an extra um, Sandy every three to four years. Um, last year was a $300 billion year in terms of, of um, tropical cyclone damages, so that's a very large number. Um, so, yeah. I just have a, a quick question. I was struck by the range that you provided for RCP 2.6 versus 8.5. 8.5 is not that much higher in terms of mean sea level rise compared to 2.6. And I'm wondering why. So in the two sets of projections, so first of all, there was a yeah, so in the second set of projections with the different treatment of the ice sheets, they were much more divergent, right? So we had with, with the, the ones with the, the DeCanto and Pollard numbers, we were getting something like 30 to 100 centimeters for RCP 2.6 versus 90 to 240 centimeters for RCP 8.5. For the earlier projections, which were designed to be basically consistent with um, the IPCC's assessment, um, there wasn't a, di a, a difference in treatments of sort of dynamic changes in Antarctica between the emission scenarios, because at the time of the, uh, of the fifth assessment report, they weren't comfortable making that distinction. So I think you know, there's going to be a lot of contention about the particular DeCanto and Pollard study, but I think the idea that there's a significant emission scenario dependence is going to be a fairly robust finding. Um, DeCanto and Pollard's results suggest that there might actually be an important threshold somewhere between 2 and 3 degrees Celsius of warming that makes the difference between, between uh, um, um, those scenarios. Um, so maybe actually giving some physical meaning to why there's a 2 degree target. Um, uh, but, but, but partly, I think that's an artifact of the IPCC's approach to treatment of Antarctica and AR5. Yeah. In the back. Uh, since this statement that you made about the uh, uh, system is uh, worldwide, have you looked at other predictions based on international research? And also, would you eventually include others, other countries I'm talking about, that might be affected, uh, of course, with all this impact in terms of economic impact and all the other things, would it be make sense to include right now? Yeah, so, so, so our um, sea level rise analysis framework we've done at a global scale. The economic work we are actually working on sort of with, with, with um, Saul Shang, we're working on trying to, to expand um, to a global scale. In terms of the stakeholder work, 
I mean, I think that me, I personally am probably going to mostly focus on the US. I think at least that's where I seem to be at the moment because there's a lot to be done here and I can only do so much. Um, but certainly, I think there's a need for broader engagement. Um, Mike, Michael um, had, had, a, had a postdoc who took, or, postdoc who, or student who took, who, who took uh, uh, these projections and looked at the case of Shanghai. Um, so, yeah. I mean, there's world yeah. Yeah. numbers uh, propagate world. Yeah. And they're being paid attention to. Yeah. And I, th I, I, I feel like with the sea level rise projection at the moment, there is sort of a, a little bit of a US versus European divide in which whose numbers get used, but they're not that different. One more. Can you say a little about the, the differences in the models that spread, that spread out between 2050 and 2100? Um, they had K's on them, and they were. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you're going to have to just show me what, what you're talking, what you're talking. Uh, when, when the models diverged. Sea level rise Bayesian projection. In the Bayesian discussion, the models diverged between 2050 and 2100. You made a major point about that. Uh, kinks. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, sure. Yeah, let, yeah, let, let me. So, so, so here the question we're asking, and I know I went through this a little quickly. Um, given the current uncertainty in sea level rise, so represented by these different probability distributions sea level rise. And given this um, extreme value distribution shown here by the historical curve, right? so we take that and we shift it by the range of possible sea level rise outcomes and then take our expectation under the sea level rise uncertainty. Right? So these curves here are showing you the expected, given sea level rise uncertainty, and given what we believe, you know, our expectations about um, extreme water level return periods, you know, what is the one in 10 year flood in 2050? And then the next one is looking at the same in a high emission scenario for RCP 8.5. So let me then tell you what these different curves are. So it's the same sea level rise distribution up until the 99th percentile. Uh, in the purple curve, there's no truncation of the distribution. And the red curve, there's one where you say, OK, the 99th point ninth percentile is sort of lines up with other estimates of maximum physically plausible. So we're going to throw out things above the 99th point ninth percentile. Um, the blue one is one where we do the same thing, but we say, OK, there's one in 10,000 chance of a five meter sea level rise. Um, and then the green one is where we throw out everything uh, above the 99th percentile. So, right, so those would give you fairly similar expectations in 2050. Um, but in 2080, right, they, they lead to a, a, a big divergence, um, right? And so the point here is, you know, if this is represent, if, if changes above the 99th percentile can change your expected one in 10 year flood by a meter, right, you're extremely sensitive. And so a decision framework like benefit cost analysis that's based on things like expected welfare change is going to be pretty unstable. And so you, you need to turn instead to decision frameworks that are more robust under this uncertainty. So we're going to cut it off now. Anybody who wants to talk to Bob, he'll hang around for a few minutes. And let's thank him again.